President Obama, are you listening? I have some questions for Professor Friedman. Welcome, sir. Glad to be here. Everybody hear him okay? Can you? Uh, my first question, and all my questions, come from Free to Choose. In uh, Free to Choose, you have the famous freedom cate uh, Friedman categories of the care with which we spend money. Uh, most carefully, we spend our own money on ourselves. In the middle, other people's money on ourselves and <laughs> our money on other people. And then least of all care, other people's money on other people. <laughs> and now you've been married to Rose Friedman for 68 years. <laughs> and uh, my question is, if you spend money on her, is that a special category? <laughs> That's spending money on myself. <laughs> I am sorry that she cannot be here tonight, but she has been part of my everything I have done in my life, and I could not have done it without her. I once uh, sat next to Rose while you were giving a speech, and I noticed that she kept moving her lips. <laughs> uh, once she whispered, uh, now mention the cost of cigarettes, no, the ca sorry, the case of cigarettes, and immediately up there, too far away to have heard, he said, now let me mention the case of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, do you two communicate telepathically? No. <laughs> We communicate the same way as you do. Um, you make a point in uh, Free to Choose in the chapter on tyranny of controls, and I think it's a very beautiful point, that uh, protectionism and government intervention in general breed conflict and free markets breed cooperation. But we think of free markets as being competitive. What about that? They are competitive, but they're competitive over a broad range. And, and the, the question is, how do you make money in a free market? And you only make money if you can provide somebody with something they're willing to pay for. You can't make money any other way. Uh, and therefore, in order to make money, you have to promote cooperation because you have to do something that your customer wants you to do. You don't do it because he orders you to. You don't do it because he threatens to hit you over the head if you don't. You do it because you offer him a better buy than he can get anywhere else. Now, that's promoting cooperation. But there are other people who are trying to get him too. They're your competitors. So you can get competition among the sellers, but cooperation with the buyers. You write in this uh, chapter on the tyranny of controls, you write a lot about India and about China and about Japan. It contains a, a world survey. Um, in general, you're a little gloomy there about India? Uh, I, uh, I was in India uh, in 1955. That's what, 51 years ago. And India at that time had 300 million people as a population. Today it has a billion, which is a sign of failure, not of success. Uh, and at the time I was in India, at that time, I was in India at that time on behalf of the American government to serve as an economic advisor to the Minister of Finance. And I concluded then that India had tremendous potentiality, but none of it was being achieved. And it's that that underlies what you're referring to about free to choose. Free to choose, remember, free to choose 
was aired in 1980, in January 1980. And as of that time, there had been no progress in India. The population had grown, but the average level of living, standard of living, was as low as it was in 55. Now, in the past 10 years or 15 years, there has been movement in India. And maybe those hidden potentials, which I saw in 1955, will finally be achieved. But I think you better cover your bets a little before you decide. <laughs> I do notice myself that uh, both the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition of India have had articles in the Wall Street Journal in the last six months proclaiming the glories of their British heritage, mm -hmm. which I think would have been impossible even 10 years ago, something. Um, I'm going to ask you about the world for a little while, not, not much longer, but... Um, uh, no small topics. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, about China, you write, letting the genie of initiative out of the bottle, even to this limited extent, now of course this is 1980, a little before 1980, even to this limited extent, will give rise to political problems that sooner or later are likely to produce a reaction toward greater authoritarianism. The opposite outcome, the collapse of communism and its replacement by a market system, seems far less likely, though an incurable optimist, you do not rule it out completely. What do you think about that today? Well, I'm much more optimistic about that today than I was then. China has made great progress since that time. It certainly has not achieved complete political freedom, but it's come closer. It certainly has had a great deal more economic freedom. Mm. Uh, I, was, uh, I visited China for the first time in 1980, after Free to Choose had come out. Uh, I was there as a guest of the government to give talks on how to stop inflation and other things. And China at that time was just beginning to emerge from its initial state and was in a very poor way. Uh, the, uh, I could, the hotel we stayed in showed every sign of being run by a communist state and not by... <laughs> But we returned to China twice later, once in uh, 1980, I, uh, I've forgotten the exact dates, once in the 1980s and once in the 1990s. And the, transform the change was tremendous. In 1980 when we were there, uh, the, the, everybody was wearing the Mao costume, uh, you had bicycles all over the place, but in very few cars. <laughs> the clothes were dull and drab. Ten years later when we were there, you started to see some clothes, some color in the clothes that people were wearing. There was uh, things available for sale that hadn't been sale available before. Free markets were breaking out all over the place. And China has continued growing at a dramatic rate. But, uh, I, in the fray, in the piece you referred to. I talked about the political conflict that was coming. That broke out in Tiananmen Square. And that's still to come. The final outcome in China will not be decided until you really have a showdown between the political tyranny on the one hand and the economic freedom on the other. They cannot coexist. Um, Mark Stein and some other commentators have noticed that the demographic trends establish something. They think that, uh, I think what Mark Stein writes is that 40% of the young men in the world in about 10 years are going to be living in oppressed Muslim countries. Do you think that, uh, what, what do you think the effect of that is going to be? Well, I really don't know. They, uh, 
It all depends on what happens in those Muslim countries between now and then. If we succeed in any way in bringing some element of greater economic freedom to the Muslim countries, just as India in 1955 had great potentials that were unrealized, I think the Middle East has great potentials that are unrealized. In part, in the Middle East case, it's because of the curse of their being blessed with oil. Oil has been a blessing on one, from one point of view, but a curse from another. Almost every country that has been rich in oil has been a, de a, de been a despotism, if you look at the whole Middle East area. Why do you think that happens? I, that happened for one reason and one reason only, because the oil was possessed by the government. If in those same countries that oil had been privately owned and been private property, you would not have had the same political outcomes. Mm. And that's why right now, I believe a big mistake is being made in Iraq. The first thing that should have been done in Iraq was to privatize the oil fields. That would have, if the government had said we're going to give every male or f and female over 21 years of age X shares in a corporation to which we will assign all the rights for oil, and that corporation will be free to make whatever arrangements and deals it wants with foreign country, companies, with Shell, with uh, all of the other companies and the income from the development of oil will go as dividends to the people who own these shares. You would have provided an income to the whole people of Iraq, and it would have, you would have avoided the disputes between the Sunni, Sunnis and the Shia and the Kurds, because it would have been an individual basis and not a group basis. Now, that There are, there are several people who have suggested this. I think there was another story in the Wall Street Journal very recently along these lines. I think we may have sent some economists from Yale over to Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Professor Becker was selfish. He refused to go. <laughs> if um, There's a, a point implicit in that, maybe. Um, you've got these societies and their they have a kind of tribal basis, and they have a uh, theocracy, and they have long-held habits of despotic rule. And, and they don't have the uh, impersonal uh, equality sort of relations that make people keep contracts with strangers. Is it your view that the introduction of free markets in a place like that could overcome those obstacles in soon? Quickly? I don't know how quickly, but pretty quickly, yes. I think that, I think that nothing uh, is so important as giving people property in their own right, a feeling that they own something that they're responsible for, that they have control over, and that they can dispose of. And so, uh, uh, just look at the transformation in China compared to what it was 30 years ago. You've had all the despotic tendencies in China remaining there. You, you write in Free to Choose about the changes in Japan and their rapidity. That's right. So in Japan, again, was a case which, which changed very dramatically and very quickly. So maybe the mistake, if we've made a mistake, maybe one mistake we've made is just not being aggressive enough about property rights and markets. And I think that's right. I think that the tendency, and we're making that mistake here in the United States right now, in medical care. We have a socialist, communist system of distributing medical care. Instead of letting people have their own, have their own uh, hire their own physicians and pay them, people 
nobody pays his own medical bills. There's a third party payment. It's exactly the communist system. And it has a communist result. <laughs> We've had a miracle in medical science. From the discovery of penicillin on to all the other antibiotics, to all of the surgery, the uh, MRIs, the C cats and whatnot. You've had a, uh, the last 30 or 40 years have really been a, a period of miraculous change in medical science. On the other hand, we've seen costs skyrocket to the ceiling. Nobody is happy. Physicians don't like it. Patients don't like it. Why? Because none of them are responsible for themselves. <coughs> They're all being uh, uh, the, you no longer have a situation in which a patient goes to a physician, uh, chooses a physician, the physician agrees to serve, the patient gets service, gets charged and paid for it. There's no direct relation between the patient and the physician. The, pay, the physician today is an employee of an insurance company or an employee of the government. It's a third party who pays. And when you go to the doctor, you don't care. You don't ask about what the charge is going to be. That's not, somebody else is going to take care of that. And the end result has been that you have third party payment and third party treatment. You wrote about that in the uh, Yes, I did. Choose. Oh, yeah. I've how, written about it in several places. How, how could, um, you know, it, it, uh, we began the current term of the president with a, with a campaign for private accounts and Social Security, but that, that was preceded by prescription drug benefits and the big expansion of Medicare. After all this time, how can that still happen? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that question. <laughs> uh, but you notice that the expansion of the drug, pro drug uh, business was accompanied by the introduction of, of health savings accounts, HSAs. And that's the other tendency. That's the one hopeful sign in the medical area because that's a step in the direction of having people be responsible for themselves and for their own care. Hillsdale College is saving uh, about $450,000 a year through HSAs. Who is? Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College is. It's amazing, yeah. by the way. You just, you wouldn't believe. It just... Uh, Nobody I mean, spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you caught Milton's answer when I asked him, what category is Rose in? And he said, that's spending on myself. <laughs> if, um, it, it, I, I will tell you, it, uh, we made a decision four or five years ago, I'm looking for Chairman Broadbeck to help me remember when it was, four years ago, and we were, you know, it cost money, and we didn't have it. And on the other hand, we were watching, you know, we were negotiating and fighting and agreeing to stricter rationing of health care to keep inflation annually down to 8%. And one year it was 20%. And we thought, this is just going to eat us alive. And you know, it is, what, four years later, and it is basically flat after four years. Yeah. And nobody else we know of has that experience. Oh, well, a few private firms, which have yeah. four versus one. Uh -huh. That's right, yeah. Now, I'm going to read you, uh, you tell a great story in uh, Free to Choose about uh, Senator Scoop Jackson giving the oil companies a lamb basting for their obscene profits. Um, does that remind you of anything going on today? You answer that. 
It is, I, I looked at this quote. This is one of my favorite quotes in the book. I'll find it again. Because I invite you, by the way, you ought to go all right, buy a copy of this book or get one in the library and, uh, and read this book because you, you won't believe how good it is. And, you know, I read it with excitement 20, 25 years ago yeah. and just thought, wow, you know, what a thing. And I saw the film that Bob made with Milton and Rose. And, and uh, you just won't believe how strong and clear it is. And here's a powerful passage. And remember, it's written 25 years ago. As we, Milton and Rose, have gone through the literature on Social Security, we've been shocked at the arguments that have been used to defend the program. Individuals who would not lie to their children, their friends, their colleagues, whom all of us would trust implicitly in the most important personal dealings, have propagated a false view of Social Security. Their intelligence and exposure to contrary views make it hard to believe, this is a charitable point, make it hard to believe that they have done so unintentionally and innocently. Apparently they have regarded themselves as an elite group within society that knows what is good for other people better than those people do for themselves. After 25 years, are you ready to call those people liars? <laughs> I stick by every word there. <laughs> but there has been progress since then. Do you think net progress? Well, that's the question. Uh, when you asked me to do this, you suggested the theme of before and after Free to Choose. Now, Free to Choose was, pub was, was produced shown on TV for the first time in January 1980. President Reagan was elected in November 1980. And so before and after free choose is almost the same thing as before and after Ronald Reagan. And in, tr in trying to think of how I could best answer the question you raised, I dug out a couple of old charts I had made some time ago. And those charts are now a, the, the yeah. Somebody here is, has those charts. We'll have them on. There it is. You see how, how efficient Hillsdale is? <laughs> Privately funded. <laughs> but that, that's a picture of whether there is a difference between before and after 1980. It really isn't before and after free to choose, but it's before and after Reagan. And if you look at that, the, uh, you'll see the one line. The, the line that goes quickly up that is government spending, federal, state, and local, excluding defense, non-defense spending, as a fraction of national income. And you'll see that between 19, the early 1950s and 1980, we were in a period of what I would call galloping socialism. <laughs> and you'll see that government spending was going up along a very rapid straight line. And that if that had continued, the extrapolation there, the red line there, shows what would have happened to it. Instead, nine, with Reagan's election, it just brought a stop, complete stop, abrupt and immediate stop to that expansion in government spending. But it didn't bring it down. What it did is to hold it constant from that time to now. And, uh, uh, we're still at that point. There's been the, the early Bush years saw an increase in government spending, but more recently they've been holding it down some, somewhat. And uh, income has been going up rapidly, so that government spending as a fraction of income has been staying constant or going down. But we still haven't. We've, we've, gone, we've done the first thing. The first thing is to stop the growth of government. The second thing is to bring government down and make it smaller. We haven't done that yet, but this is a pretty good for, uh, start. Wow. There's another chart, which is of a different aspect. There it is. 
And that, before and after Reagan, you can see that made a really bigger difference. And that had to do with the number of pages in the Federal Register, which records, <laughs> records all the regulate, rules and regulations. And you can see that Reagan really knocked that way down. But he did, once Reagan was out, it started to go up again. And we have not really succeeded in that area. But I thought that would give some idea of the... So there have been real... So go back. There have been real changes in our society since Free to Choose was published. I'm not attributing them to Free to Choose. I'm not saying that that's the reason. But in general, there has been a complete change in the uh, uh, public attitude, the public opinion. It probably owes as much to the collapse of the Soviet Union as it does to what Friedrich Hayek or Milton Friedman or somebody else wrote. But uh, what uh, socialism used to mean the ownership and operation of the means of production. Nobody gives it that meaning today. There is no country in the world today that, that really tried to be socialist in that sense except for North Korea. And maybe right now Russia is moving in that direction. But that's about it. The, uh, but on the other hand, it, uh, the opinion has not shifted far enough in terms of the dangers of a big government and the effect it can have. And that's where we're facing problems for the future. That's what Hillsdale has to do what Hillsdale's companions have to do all over the country is to make clear that the only reason we have our freedom is because government is so inefficient. <laughs> if the government were, able, were, were efficient in spending nearly the something like 40% of our income that it disposes of, we wouldn't be as free as we are today. If uh, you, you write in, uh, I, I will tell you that reading Free to Choose again, one thing that strikes me is, um, on the one hand, the book has the tone of a rallying call. It's a very powerful book. And then when you examine the um, predictions and the assertions in it, they tend to be carefully made. What, what you just said was, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily something I wrote. You're, you're always careful about that. In the book, in, in, this, in this early on in the book, you bring up Abraham Lincoln, and you bring up the House Divided speech, and you put the book early on in, in the book as uh, addressing a great test the American people have to face. A house divided against itself cannot stand. It's going to be a government intervention country or it's going to be a free market country. That's right. Can't go on indefinitely the way it is. That's right. And you still believe that? Yes, I very much believe that. And so... And I believe, as I say, that we've been making some headway in the past 25 years, but mostly it's just holding well, it's real headway compared to what was going before, but it's mostly holding ground. Mm. Now, um, I'm going to argue that uh, I'm going to argue that you're great. Um, <laughs> well, I'll have to contest that. <laughs> I, 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 you know. And, but, but think, though, you're in a tough spot because let's say I win, you're great. Let's say you win, you're um, great. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm pretty good. So, <laughs> so, so think of this. I, 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 uh, there are two chapters in the middle of the book that are associated with one of the reasons you won the Nobel Prize, one of the really amazing things you did. There was this linchpin in history. You won the Nobel Prize. One of the really amazing things you did. 
there was this linchpin in history, this moment in history that I think if, if I read the monetary history of the United States rightly, and I have read that book with care and huge pleasure, um, I believe what you think is that the evils that are upon us today were, were, were prepared in the crisis of the Great Depression. And that the failure to understand that crisis when it was upon us and the exploitation of it later by people who violated the plain truth of the matter, that the, that the, the story of modern America is written in that turning point. And I believe no one can read the middle chapter of that about the great contraction without seeing a powerful sense of tragedy settle upon you. What an awful thing to have happened. Used by charlatans for the worst of reasons and, and uh, inflicted upon people who couldn't see the simple thing needing seeing. Now, if that's true, if that awfulness, the danger to our freedom in the greatest republic in the world comes from that thing. Now, now here's my point. Excuse me talking so long, but I indulge myself because I'm praising you. Well, I enjoy listening to you, too. Yeah, okay, good. We're doing, we're doing all right. I'm thinking, you know, he's too quick for me, but if I talk nice, who knows? The, the evil party in this thing is an agency and the people who ran it and a bureaucratic infighting inside that agency between the New York office and the other branches. Yes. And you talk about a heyday that had come in that agency in the 20s under Benjamin Strong. Well, the, well Benjamin Strong uh, was on the side of the right, as uh, of the correct. He was on the right side. And if he had lived, I firmly believe that if he had lived, there would not have been a Great Depression. Now, my question is about whether you think the last 20 years, 25 years, have been a second heyday. <clears throat> oh, they have been much better heyday than they were under the last, in the terms you're now coming to, the last 25 years have really been phenomenal. From the, <clears throat> uh, This really has very little to do with the, most of what we've been talking about, with the conflict between government and private enterprise. It really has to do with the technical problem of how you run a monetary policy. Now, in the last 20, or well, from the middle of the 80s, from about 1985, well, that's 20, 20 years, not 25 years, have been unprecedented in the history of the world. You will find no other 20-year period in the world in which prices have been as stable, relatively speaking. There's been as little variability in price levels, in which inflation has been as much controlled, in which output has gone up as regularly. This is, we are now, uh, you hear all this crazy talk about the economic difficulties and the problems when the fact is that we are at the absolute peak of prosperity in the history of the world. Never before have so many people had so much as they do today. And I believe a large part of that is to be attributed to the better, oper better monetary policy. Uh, what caused that? I believe in this case, it really has been a result of the scientific work that's been done of the, well, uh, of the... And who did that? Well, lots of people. <laughs> and who did the most of it? <laughs> no, lots of people. I'm not... <laughs> but the acceptance of the view that inflation is a monetary phenomenon, that it's not a real phenomenon, the acceptance of the view that central banks are primarily responsible for maintaining stable prices, and, and nothing else. And here's how it's connected, though. Because if the danger is that our house is divided, we're in a great conflict for the soul of our republic. Everybody in this room and the children of everybody in this room 
have a profound stake in the outcome of that conflict, and it was triggered by bad money policy. It was triggered by at bad a crucial money. moment. Absolutely. And in a 25-year period, we have had the greatest, you just said it, greatest monetary policy in history. That's right. And so that evil in our time has been removed from us, and that is because some unnamed people did some work. I can't complain about that. <laughs> and it just so happens one of them won the Nobel Prize in an act of justice. But you still, if you really go around now and ask people uh, what, was, what caused the Great Depression, nine out of ten will still tell you it was a failure of business. I, I suspect. I hope I'm wrong. But there, it's absolutely clear that it was a failure of government and not a failure of business. You don't think it was the Smoot-Hawley tariff? No. I think the Smoot-Hawley tariff was a bad law. I think it did harm, but the Smoot-Hawley tariff would not have made a quarter of the population unemployed. But, a, but a, reducing the quantity of money by a third did make a quarter of the population unemployed. You know what the trouble is with being brilliant? I imagine. <laughs> You, he's got a good imagination. <laughs> I think what it is is that other people are not. But I, I mean, if you the monetary history of the United States, which is a, a, a very extraordinary book. I, I, I've studied a lot of history in my life. It is a wonderful narrative history. And, and uh, it looks to me like, for, for one thing, if you're looking for a cause big enough to manage, you know, to explain the problem. A friend of mine, a historian, he, he died tragically early in his life. His name is Tom Silver. He's the one who first got me reading Milton Friedman. He wrote a beautiful book about Calvin Coolidge. And he went through the newspaper reports about the smooth holly tariff. And they just don't match up. And on the other hand, inflation and deflation, writes a great man, are monetary phenomena. And so, wouldn't, and I, I guess my, my point is, and I want to hammer it home, and I, I really, apart from doing the public service of saying honorific things about a man worthy of it, there's also the point about all of us in this room, because we've all got a job to do, and uh, we've got to save our republic. And the point is, if you look back in the past, I will tell you, Winston Churchill was desperately confused by the Great Depression. So were a lot of people. And, and there was a lot to be confused about. I graduated from college, undergraduate college, in 1932. In 1932, unemployment number 25 million. I, I, as a college graduate, was baffled by how you could have a world in which there were idle machines and idle men, and you couldn't get them together again. There were the machines, there were the men. They wanted to cooperate. They wanted to work. They wanted to produce the clothes they wore. They wanted to produce the food they ate. And yet somehow or other, something had gone wrong with the machine, and you couldn't get them together again. That was a lot to be confused about. Yeah. Ch Churchill's expression for it was the uh, puzzle of, uh, of uh, paucity amidst plenty. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just was flummoxed him. And he, you know, he was a free trader all this time. Oh, sure. And he just, he thought, you know, these arguments were made that that was the cause of it. And, and you know, the big liberal explanation in Arthur Schlesinger and people like that was, and it, it really was, it was the artful thing that was said to undergird the New Deal, was the underconsumptionist thesis. And that is, the rich people and the manufacturers had accumulated all the wealth, so there wasn't anybody left to buy their products. And that's what caused the unemployment. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I, I, I don't 
Lord help us if I should catch myself repeating your arguments to you, but I just did it. Um, isn't my point... Well, that makes sure they're correct arguments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being as careful as I can. But isn't, isn't it true then if you were going to list the progress that has been made in the fight against big government, the understanding of the causes of the Great Depression, and the understanding of a thing that is apparently something more than merely technical about the way to regulate the money supply is a very important and useful achievement. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt it is. Yeah. And that would be you. I think that's one respect. I think that the lesson has been learned, and I am very optimistic that this, we will, well, it won't last forever, because sooner or later, government will want to uh, raise money without imposing taxes. It will want to spend money. And so uh, I hesitate to join those who are predicting 20 years inflation at 2% per year. Mm. Because the temptation for governments to lay their hands on that money is going to be very hard to resist. Does Mr. Bernanke look pretty good to you? Yes, he looks very good to me. But we'll have to see. He's, he's the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I think. But you, you must understand that the fundamental problem is that you shouldn't have an institution which depends on whether he's good or not. <laughs> Now, so my first preference would be to abolish the Federal Reserve. <laughs> but that, that's not, that's not going to happen. Don't kid yourself. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you about vouchers for a little while. Good. Because they're dear to your heart. And also, um, if I'm any reader of uh, audience body language, you guys will sit here all night but we're not actually going to ask Professor Friedman to do that. So we're going to, uh, where's my boss over there? How are we doing? A few more minutes? OK. Um, You're three minutes over time now. <laughs> <laughs> but we have time for vouchers. Now's the time. Now's the time when I get really happy about being the boss. Um, in, um, I, I just want to talk about education a little bit. Um, I, I had a talk once with the late John Walton, really wonderful fellow. Yes, he was. Uh, Arkansan, like me, and uh, a brave, great man. And he said to me once, he said, uh, he was going to go negotiate with the teachers union. Thought he could make a deal with them, he learned better. And he said, but surely we can all agree to do what's good for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> why, why can't we agree about that? Well, the president of the National Education Association, uh, you know his name, and for, one of the things about aging is that you forget names. But at any rate, the president John of... John Sloan. Uh, well, John Slime. No, that's not No, him. no, no. no. <laughs> you got the wrong one. <laughs> but the president of the National Education Association was once asked, uh, somebody asked him, when, they, when, he, when, was, when is the union, your union, going to do something about students? He said, well, when they become members of the union, we'll take care of them. <laughs> and that was a correct answer. He was, in his capacity, was to serve the members of his union, not to serve public purposes. Mm. And the trade, I, I give him credit, the trade union has been very effective in serving the members of their union. In the process, they've destroyed American education. But that isn't their function. <laughs> and it's our fault. It's, it's our fault for allowing them to do it. But you, you see, you've got two areas in the, in the United States which suffer from the same disease. Education is one and health care is the other. And they both suffer from the disease of uh, 
but, uh, taking a system which should be bottom up and converting it into a system that is top down. Education is a simple case. We don't want to, we don't, it isn't a public purpose to build brick schools and, and have students taught there. The public purpose is to provide education. You're a producer, producing a product. And if you want to subsidize the production of that product, there are two ways you can do it. You can subsidize the producer or you can subsidize the consumer. In education, we subsidize the producer. We subsidize the school. If you subsidize the student instead, you would have competition. The student could choose which school he would go to, and that would force the schools to improve and to meet the taste of their students. And the same thing is happening in, 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 in health care. You've got a system under which you're subsidizing the producers, the physicians, the insurance companies, and so on. You're not really subsidizing directly the students, the, 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 the uh, patients. You talk about a lot of policy issues in Free to Choose, and in your life, and some indications in the book too, you've settled on education and on the device of policy reform of vouchers is crucial, is the, is, is the thing to concentrate on. And, and by the way, I, I'll say to everybody here, Milton and Rose Friedman have given very generously to a foundation in their name to support vouchers, and so should you. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> It is, uh, it is the second best charity represented on this dais. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But it's, uh, it, uh, you're the better man. But if, if uh, why that is the thing to choose? Why is that your focus? Well, I don't see how we can maintain a decent society if we have a world in which you are split into haves and have-nots and the haves are subsidizing the have-nots. Here is a situation in which we have an educational system in which something like 30% of the youngsters who start high school never finish, never get it. They are condemned to, a, uh, to low income jobs. They are condemned to a situation in which they are going to be at the bottom. And that, that leads to a divisive society. It leads to a to a uh, stratified society rather than one of general cooperation and general understanding. The, uh, uh, you could go on uh, along that line. Uh, literacy today in the United States, effective literacy, is almost surely less than it was a hundred years ago. Before we had any government involved in education at all, you had uh, the majority of youngsters were schooled and were, were re literate, were able to learn. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a disgrace for a country like the United States uh, to have 30% of the population never graduate from high school. And the number is more than that because I've left out those who have dropped out through elementary school. It's a disgrace that people can't sp read and write and uh, it's hard for me to see how we can continue to maintain a decent, free, human society if you have a large subsection which is condemned to poverty and to be to handouts. Mm -hmm. Do you do you uh, do you think voucher campaign the voucher campaign is going well? No. No. I think it's going badly by my lights, and the reason is that so far as we've been making, making success so far, it's almost entirely for, for uh, income limited vouchers. I believe there are two kinds of vouchers you can have. You can think of vouchers as charity voucher. If your major objective is to help the low, this 30 people, then you have a voucher, you have a voucher program which is limited 
and available only to people below a certain income. Or you can have an educational voucher. If you think of vouchers as a way of transforming the educational industry, then you have one which is available to everybody. And why aren't they available to everybody? The, the Constitution in the various states, uh, the policy of the Fed, first of all, education ought to be a state and local matter, not a federal matter. <laughs> you know, in their program for America in 1994, was it? One of the elements was to eliminate the Department of Education. <laughs> that was a good, pro good pro program. Good pro and instead, what have we done? The financing of the Department of Education, I think, has tripled since then. It's gone just the other way. So it ought to be a local matter, but it ought to be a parental matter. The responsibility for educating children is with their parents. And in order to make it a parental matter, you have to have a situation in which the parents are free to choose the schools their children go to. They aren't now. Today, the schools pick the children. The children are assigned to schools by geography, by where they live. And essentially, you've got a, a school picking its own children, their own scholars. Now, the way in which you want to get a, a, a parents choosing is to have, is to say, if the government is going to spend money on education, maybe it shouldn't spend any, but if it's going to spend any, it ought to be go on the backs of the children. Its objective ought to be to have educated children, not to have beautiful buildings. And the way to get to that is to have a universal voucher in which the, uh, the as I said in 1955, take the amount of money that we're now spending on education divided by the number of children and give that amount of money to each parent uh, as a, that's what we're now spending now. We keep on spending that, but spend it in the form of vouchers going to all parents. So, um, Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation in San Francisco? No. It's in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. <laughs> and it's really, it's really run. I'm not, I don't do any running of it. It's run by Gordon San Angelo, who has been doing a very good job with the foundation. I'm not complaining about the foundation. I'm complaining about the fact that we haven't made enough progress. Well, I, I just want to say, I'm not sure what Hillsdale College would do without the Department of Education. <laughs> <laughs> He's a supporter of the Department of Education. <laughs> well, you see, that's the problem. That shows you the problem of a self-interest society. Your self-interest is to maintain the Department of Education. <laughs> it is true, but that was only a joke. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually did go and spent three days last fall lobbying to get them not to pass, reauthorize the Higher Education Act, which they have now, the Republican Party, made worse than it was before they got there. And I begged them not to do it. And uh, it was one of the most disappointing and hilarious experiences I've ever had. Mm -hmm. They would, uh, I mean, it was just dog dumb. It, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to go on. But I, I know. <laughs> I, I, by the way, so I'll just I'll say this much conservatives and liberal in the true sense minded people are as a group incredibly silly about higher education and what it takes to make it work. And if you want to know, I, I, uh, I kept calling out when I was reading about two nights ago, Free to Choose. If you want to know how to think about it, it is in that book and it is perfect in there. Speaking as a college president. Okay, I have one more couple of questions for you. <laughs> We're going to charge him pretty soon for a minute. <laughs> really just one. 
It has to do with yourself. Uh, you describe a society in which people look after themselves. They know the most about themselves, they can take care of themselves the best, and they will flourish if you let them. And you yourself, however, are a crusader for the rights of others. You, you say in the Free to Choose that it's, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's very like you, it's a very powerful statement. A tiny minority is what matters. I just want you to, and, and I want to repeat something I said before because it's always struck me as um, a really wonderful thing about certain few people. Clarence Thomas is such a person. He holds this really high station. He could do anything with his life. He continues to be the ogre he was before. And you won the Nobel Prize in 1976, 200th birthday of the Declaration of Independence. What a fitting thing. And then you did this thing in 1980. And it's not like you just wrote some you know, book to give at the Western Economics Association or paper. This is a movie and an attack on the strongest forces in the land who would adore you if you would just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so if you put all that together, that means that uh, one of the weaknesses of the free market is it, it requires certain extremely talented and not self-interested people. Oh, yes, they're self-interested. Oh, no, that's not right. But their self-interest is promoting public policy. How that's is that? That's what they're interested in doing. How is that? Uh, it, how, it, how, how, what was my self-interest? My self-interest to begin with was to, uh, when I graduated from college, as they say, we were in this deep depression and a uh, real mystery and puzzle. And my self-interest was to try to understand why that happened. And that's what I enjoyed doing. That was my self-interest. And out of that, I grew to learn some things, to have some knowledge. And then my self-interest was to see that other people adopted the same, understood the same things, and made the changes that were called for by them. Self-interest means here what you wanted. Self-interest is what you want, sure. The, um, uh, uh, Mother Teresa was operating on a completely self-interested basis. Yeah, but... Self-interest does not mean narrow self-interest. Self-interest does not mean monetary self-interest. Self-interest means pursuing those things that are valuable to you. And there will be some, and people, everybody, will value things other uh, beyond, uh, once they get the basic of living. They will give great, they will value things other than their immediate material energy. So it's a synonym for self-sacrifice. You know, just look, if you want to see how pervasive is non-self-interest, look at the uh, amount of money that was contributed to after Katrina. That was a tremendous ex display of the of, the, of what it was a self-interest. A self-interest of people was to do good. And in that sense of self-interest, you are indeed a supremely self-interested man. Absolutely. <laughs> It has been uh, a privilege to be with you, sir, and on behalf of everyone here, I thank you most warmly. Well, I thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh.